Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Homage to him, the worthy one, the fully enlightened one, Sadhu. So we have some questions that came in. Does anybody here have questions? Anything they'd like to ask about what we did with the workshop? Any questions about that? Anybody? Boy, I must, it must have still been a good workshop. <laughs> okay. Um, tonight we're going to take a look at craving a little bit closer than usual. And we're going to, what we're doing is we're going to examine the training chart that you have, the seven links, and look more closely at the red zone and what I call the red zone, the craving, the clinging, the habitual tendencies, the birth of the reaction, and then the tail end of the event. But tonight we're just going to look at craving. One thing, um, it, when I learned this and we were building this program, uh, Bonte sort of asked the, us to ask me to uh, take one piece at a time and really go more closely to look at that piece and how it works. And I think it's, it can't be gone over enough because the, the dependent origination is the absolute spine of the teaching. You know, when we say it's the spine of the teaching, if you can just imagine me uh, finding, um, you know, uh, an animal that didn't have a spine in it and I pick it up, it would just look like a sack, kind of just like a sack with no stability, no structure. And this is what happens if you don't teach the dependent origination in a way that you can use it. Um, because it has been isolated by the commentaries in a way that people would just accept that what they heard and think about it as a philosophical something that would spread over three lifetimes. And um, if you've been coming and listening here, you know that one of the most important things is to always be looking for ways to take the practice and put them to work in your life as you are um, living your life. Not to keep the whole thing isolated with the idea of retreats and life, but to look at the retreats as training times to sharpen the mindfulness, sharpen your observation, sharpen and tu the tuning of your amount of uh, concentration, the tuning of everything, that's what the retreat's for. And what the, uh, is expected is when you leave the retreat, you would keep going and using what you've learned if it is easy enough to keep using in life. And the steps in the um, right effort are so easy to follow that it makes a lot of sense. So the pieces we have to get very familiar with are the piece of craving and the clinging and the habitual tendencies to react. And so we begin to understand how to detect them and what part do they play in the teaching. So tonight I have some, uh, the paper that I sent to you guys, um, that piece and we're going to go through that i'm not going to do absolutely all of it but i'm going to do most of it and then uh i have some pieces in the text if i read a couple of them you'll hear how it is repeated the question of the aggregates we start by looking at the aggregates this time and the next uh one that we look at we will look at craving really deeply. And the one after that will be clinging 
and then after that, the habitual tendencies, and after that. So we just keep going each week, and you keep watching in your practice. This is what's important. Can I realize how this, how the aggregates? are affected if I am craving and clinging, or if I'm not craving and clinging, how is it, you see? But first we have to really get to know these aggregates because they're a primary foundation part outside of the um, 37 requisites, okay? Um, there's been a couple of class requests, and if you have a class request, I would like you to write me and tell me that you have a, um, a class request. So what I mean by a class request is um, some people have written me about terminology because our terminology, our definitions are a little bit different. And the question is, well, do we have a glossary? Well, we started to build a glossary. We have a basic glossary um, and we can hand that out and we can add to it. You can help us to say, we have to put this word in, we have to put that word in. And, and make sure that we keep building it all the time. That's how we did it in the beginning. And it's good for us to do it over here because it's different than what people uh, are used, used to in the United States and used to in Asia, different. So one class request was, can we have a class where we talk about terminology that I'm using when I teach and you want to know what it is. And some of the examples they gave were, um, what is merit? Um, what is a naga when we say our prayer at the end? Um, and there was another one, another word in there too. There were three words initially and someone else sent some others in. Any words that you hear, mark them down, send me a note so we can put those into that, make sure that we are telling you what everything means. Second class request um, was to ask you at the end of classes to, to write questions, to put questions up to me in the email. And I've been slow on the email. I, I have um, been off and on, well and not well, and well and not well. And I've had to uh, put, get stuck in bed a lot with a sore leg that I have. So I'm working, uh, working on this and trying to straighten it out. But, um, so I haven't been as fast replying as I have been because the problem is sitting and, and working so much on the computer. Uh, uh, one other question that was asked and you might have thought about it yourself is um, what does mixing practices mean when we say don't mix practices? And this is a good question so that you all understand how this works. Um, when we're saying to you, don't mix practices together, we're talking about the rules and definitions and terminology that's in, in the uh, Anapana, Sati, in Anapana practice, the breathing meditation, and Metta, when we move over to Metta and we give you a set of instructions to really follow those set of instructions, and we give you uh, a instruction sheet for metta initially uh, as you begin that's only about 10 minutes long to listen to it 10 or 12 minutes so refreshing yourself a couple times a week and listening to those instructions and just quietly listening and seeing am i violating any of this am i following the instructions or am i mixing things up the breathing, don't get involved in following the breath when you're practicing the Brahma Viharas. Only be involved with the way that you're being told to be involved, specifically with the instructions where you start with metta. So the, um, okay, the question, the way it came to me about mixing up the practices is interesting because Someone had a family member that was a very good friend and the family that was struck, stricken with someone who was dying. And they wanted to, they were practicing met, uh, forgiveness. They were practicing forgiveness and they wanted to know, well, is it okay for me to use the metta uh, while I'm 
you know, because I want to help these people. And certainly when you're training in Meta, from the very beginning, if something's happening where you personally need Meta, you have to take Meta for yourself and send yourself Meta. And anybody who says don't send it to yourself puts you in a position where you might not have any inside you to share with anyone else. Because the person has to love themselves and be compassionate care for the compassionately care for the person that's you first in order to be able to be kind to another person very difficult if you don't like yourself and you are not um, taking care of yourself for you to be sincere if you're going to teach metta to somebody else or the karuna or the mudita or the upeka any of it okay so with metta, you're always free to use your metta to help other people or a situation that you find when you're driving to work or somebody falling down, you're helping them get up. You use the metta in the office, use it when you're working and, and, and emanating it, emanating is a good word, emanating it is shining like a candle and letting it go around, okay? And... When you are not in your, uh, not in your practice or uh, if you are in another situation where you are helping somebody, um, that's where you can use it. But don't, you need to catch yourself if you start paying attention to the breath when you are um, practicing the metta to learn the Brahma Viharas and you're going to start with metta. You have to be very careful because your attention will go to the breath and it'll take a lot, take too much away from uh, the practice that you're attempting to learn the metta, okay? Um, we can wait for a while to do the rest of this. We want to go. Hello, Deepa. How are you? Hello, Ingrid. Uh, good you're here. Kiran is here. Um, maybe. Okay, Carolyn. Hi. Hi, Perel. Everybody. Hi. Okay, it's ha I'm happy to see everybody here. We're going to go now into this uh, this next uh, part of the. Which one is this? Um, okay, we're just going to bring this one up, and I'm going to start out by uh, saying this. This is about if you missed what I was saying in the beginning. What we're doing now is we're going to look at very more, more deeply at the links that are on the, uh, the seven links in your training chart. We're going to look at these more closely. But before we do that, we're going to we take one piece that is not usually, you know, we talk about these, but we usually don't have classes on them. But we start by saying, how did the Buddha find the mind-body connection. So we want to look at the aggregates first. And the, what are the aggregates are the pieces that make up the concept called the human being or the being. And in, in the uh, Buddhist sense, uh, the five aggregates, you have the five aggregates, the six sense doors, and after reviewing dependent origination, now we're going to follow through by looking at mind, body, contact, and feeling, and getting a feel for what's happening with the aggregates. So this includes a clear first look at how contact happens, because that's the thing that happens and sets off the feeling. Q is involved in this. I took a lot of what he said out of here, but Q is still here. So now we're going to go a little bit more deeply into the being first and make sure we understand we're made up of five aggregates that interplay so that existence can be experienced in this life. And we, we were going to walk through some of the links of cognition as they happen. And so Q is wanting to know, what am I thinking about in the beginning when I'm first writing this? He asked the question, what are you thinking? And I was just thinking about learning to sail at camp many years ago. For some reason, this came up when Bonte was talking about the aggregates. 
And so he says, what about it? And I say, well, we really had some good counselors when I was uh, at camp this one time for about three years. My great, great aunt paid for me to go to camp. It was really fun. And they took their time teaching us everything that we would need to know how to race a sailboat for ourselves on a large body of water. So that when we went home, if we were going to New Jersey, we might sail in the ocean or so race in a bay. So when I was like 14, 15, 16 years old, I was going to the shore for a month after I had been at camp for a while away from the city. And so, for instance, they taught us about the knots and they had to make, we had to make a small board and put all the different kinds of knots. We had to make them in a small version and glue them onto a board to pass a test. We had to know all the parts of a boat if we, as, so if something ever happened, we would understand what to do to repair it or plan a course of action. And everything had to be learned, including the outer hull of the boat, the keel of the boat, which is the part that runs down the middle, keeps it from tipping so much, and the rudder for steering, the tiller for turning, the mast, which holds up the sail, the halyard, which is the line that comes from the top of the, the, top of the mast and hooks onto the sail so you can pull the sail up the mast. Uh, and then we had to learn uh, about the sail, all the parts of the sail, how to trim the sail, all of it, and how to store a boat. And we, they, would, they would take the boat apart and we would have to refit the entire boat back together. It was only then that they began teaching us actually how to read the wind on the water and how to set a course, how to hold a tack. A tack means if I want to go across a lake and the wind is coming against me, I can go like this and a zigzag. And each part of that is called a tack. And how to come about means turn around the boat and how to pick up the wind, catch the wind in the sail and trim the sail, haul the sail and win the race. So all the time that we were drilling, for maybe like one whole month of just drilling on, on the land and almost never going out in the boat by ourselves and only going out with three people or, or a counselor picking on you the whole time, you know? And uh, so they're drilling us and we, we would think about only one thing. And Q says, what? Well, how to get into the boat and just go out in the lake. It's a very, very big lake. And sometimes there is an over eagerness to get to the destination, to reach the goal, to pull, put the cart before the horse. And the lesson here is that's right. We didn't want to perfect the skill of sailing. We just wanted to own our own boat someday and just get in and brag about it and maybe take care of it the right way. But we were young and, you know, it was, we were just wanted to go and do it. So today this challenge seems to be there for some people who want to do the meditation. This came up this week with people that were calling me as I was writing this. And without mastering the knowledge that goes with the meditation, they want to reach an objective without doing the work. This is just familiar with anything that you can think of. There's always that thing where you want it instantly, I call it the immediate gratification factor. One time I met a man who was experienced, who had experienced Nibbana. It was an interesting situation. He didn't even realize what had happened. And without the understanding, he lost his attainment. And um, you can spin your wheels for a very long time and not progress down a path. It's like you're stuck in the mud if you're driving a car. But the teaching is useless if you try to practice it without the clarity that you need, like these lessons where you're learning the real guts of this. So you, it tries to become part of you. And here, now here we are 
at the beginning of a new skill in meditation and we are facing the same thing that I faced when I wanted to sail because we truly need to begin at the beginning in the first part over and over and over again until we know it by heart and can say it to someone else. We need to realize that a being, you or me, what we are before that being goes down the path. And it's true. It's true. Q asks the question, do we really need to do that? Yes. Because there are deep forests, like going through a mountain, you're going through on a journey, and you have to be armed with knowledge and vision to get through, through the forest. So I'm going to start at the beginning, because that's where we need to go with the aggregates. So the first one is we have five aggregates. And probably remember body, feeling, perception, thoughts, and consciousness. The first one we look at, we have a body and it's kaya in, in the Pali, it's kaya. And the body runs from our head to our toes, according to the Buddha. And it is composed of a very impersonal parts that show no sign of being personally unique one from another. In other words, everybody has heads and a brain, and this kind of thing, the parts of the body. In Majima Nikaya number 10, the Satipatthana Sutta, of course, if we go there, a monk or a nun reviews the same body up from the soles of the feet or down from the top of the head, bounded by skin as full of many kinds of impurities, thus, in this body, there are head hairs, body hairs, nails, teeth, and skin, flesh and sinews, which are muscles, okay, bones, bone marrow, kidney, heart, liver, diaphragm, spleen, lungs, intestines, mesentery, contents of the stomach, the feces, bile, phlegm, pus, blood, sweat, fat, tears and grease, spittle, snot, oil of the joints, and urine. That's what we are. And just as though there was a bag with an opening at both ends, it tells us, full of many sorts of grain, such as hill rice, red rice, beans, peas, millet, white rice, and a man with good eyes were to open it and review inside. Thus, this is hill rice, this is red rice, these are beans, these are peas, this is millet, this is white rice. And so too, a monk or a nun reviews the same body, the same way we just mentioned, as full of many kinds of impurities. And in this body, there are the same list of things again. And the Satipatthana goes into this. When Satipatthana, you're supposed to learn all the, all the pieces, I think it's 32 of them, and you just keep going through that in your head until just to remind yourself what you're actually made of. And that's it. This is what the body is made up of. Essentially, that's all. Now, this description isn't meant to gross you out about the body. It's just meant to give you a better perspective of what is essentially real about the body. If you're, do, if you're saying the precepts the way we teach you, you also have five verses from the Dhammapada. And one of those couplets in the Dhammapada is to learn to see what is essential and what is unessential. And the person who sees what's essential is successful. And the person who gets involved with the unessential, that person is always twisted and thinking about different things. But this is the body, plain and simple. It is as it is. And Q, of course, says, wow. <laughs> that is just what I said the first time that I met this description. It's, it is precise. It leaves nothing out. It presents the body just as you would find it in an autopsy class, in a medical school, this is basic body 101. That's what the Buddha was talking about. So that's the whole story that you need to know as far as the body is concerned. The second part 
is the being has feeling, the way to know. Now there are three kinds of feeling that we need to essentially be aware about for good meditation. There is a pleasant feeling, there is a painful feeling, and there is neither pleasant nor painful feeling. And from the beginning of your practice, we need to understand that feeling is just a feeling. This is the lesson here. Feeling is just a feeling. It is not a personal feeling, but just a feeling which occurs when conditions are right for it to happen. And if we keep this in mind, gradually we will let go of any personal attachment with the feeling and this eases the suffering. But first, we must come to understand by experiencing this for ourselves exactly what a feeling is. And these three kinds of feeling are all well initially, uh, are all we initially need to develop um, a good meditation practice. But later on, we can divide the feeling types into more defined groups for deeper understanding. So how do they do that? How do they come up with all of these feelings, you know, from three feelings to all of a sudden 18 and then 36, how do they do it? What they're doing is they're talking about multiplying the sense doors. So when you hear the suttas in order to teach you how you experience your world, you don't just say, I see the, in, the, in the suttas, if there's the dot, dot, dots, we want you to say, I see, I hear, I smell, I taste, I touch, and I experience thoughts in my mind. So we don't want you to skip the other part. Unfortunately, in the translation, Bhikkhu Bodhi's book used to be three books the same size, if you can imagine, three books, and no one would carry it around. And then finally, um, wisdom publication, they went for the ditto practice, the little dots, and put them in. And we had to restructure what we're using to teach you. And so when you go to Moving Dhamma 1, that book, uh, when I send you that book, and that is the first one that we put out with the whole entire sutta restructured for you. And so when you sit and read it, you do read them with the repetition. It's important because you're teaching mind. Dot, dot, eyes, dot, dot, ears, dot, dot, nose, dot, dot, tongue, dot, dot, body and mind. You're doing it for every part of the experience that's happening through the sense doors. If we keep this in mind, gradually we're going to release any personal attachment with the feeling, and this eases the suffering. So first, we have to understand by experiencing this for ourselves what a feeling is, as I said. So when we look at this, let's stop and look at the chart for just a minute. We go back here to the, um, to the chart. Um, See, how do I get back there? Uh, let me pull the chart up. If we were to look at something happening with our eye, and this is what I want you to really hang out with these charts sometime, just hang out with them for half an hour. <laughs> Start looking at them. If you learn these well enough and understand these little definitions, then when you go for a walk anywhere and you see a bunch of people, maybe two people arguing, and you watch how it's happening, you can see this chart. You can actually see it. If you sit in a bus and some people are um, you know, arguing with the bus driver, you can watch it happen. You can watch it happen with parents and their children, but you can actually see it between two bulls or cows or horses or any type of dogs or cats in relationships with animals. You can watch it happen too. So, the process is the same where the person has the example of the eye that sees the color and form under the contact. And then 
I consciousness comes up and the meeting of those three pieces, the I, the forms, and the I consciousness make contact happen. With contact as condition, a feeling arises. So the predecessor, the format for the feeling to come up is the experience. Now we have of the contact happening, but we, we have to remember something. When I said those, some people are really eager to get there without having to learn the whole thing. I was talking earlier, we had, I had a man come in once and he sat down in an interview and he said, I figured this all out. I don't have to suffer anymore. And I said, what did you figure out? And of course he said, I'm not going to feel anything anymore. Ah, I thought <laughs> this is not possible for the human being simply because of the structure of the anatomy of the human being. We can't just turn off our eyes and turn off our ears and turn off our nose completely and just turn off our taste and our tongue and turn off any touch or something. It's impossible. So it was just, but what is this person actually screaming? I want it now. I don't want to have to learn anything. I want it right now. Instant gratification, you see. So there are three kinds of feelings that will come up. And they are the pleasant feeling, the painful feeling, or the neither painful, pleasant nor painful feeling. And these all operate the same as they're coming up. And the some suttas will carry these through and they'll actually take you step by step. Depending on the eye um, and forms, eye consciousness arises. The meeting of the three is eye contact. With contact as condition, a feeling arises that is pleasant, painful, or neither painful nor pleasant. So I'm reciting to you a part of a sutta. If you're practicing 148, you're hearing me say that sutta. Dependent on the ear and sounds, ear consciousness comes up. And with the meeting of the three is ear contact. Contact as condition, a feeling comes up, felt as painful, pleasant, painful, or neither painful nor pleasant. And then it goes on to say, when touched by a pleasant eye feeling, if one welcomes it, delights it, and remains holding to it. Now, do you hear the conditional part of this? If a person likes it and welcomes it and holds on to it, then that person is having lust. They're experiencing lust. That's what that's showing you. Now, these things happen naturally for the people in, in living life. And if they're natural and they pass away, that's one thing. But if they're natural and you try to hold on to them and then you try to make them stay there and not go away, you are in denial of what? Anicca. You're in denying that Anicca is a real law because whatever arises will always pass away. So another thing that happens with someone who wants to cure it maybe really fast is they'll come and this happens with everybody as you're developing. You have a really good day in your meditation and you come in to the interview and you, you, the next day and you say, well, how'd it go? And well, it was okay. What happened? I tried everything I could to do what I did yesterday. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> we can never have what we did yesterday. Every single sitting is completely new and completely different and unique. This is what's so important to understand. If we try to make anything happen at all, you won't succeed in the meditation. You can't go down the path. So in essence, the actual practice is an allowing a watching like a cat, if you become a watcher, an observer, and you just keep watching inside. But remember, you can't concentrate very hard. Someone wrote and said, I have a pain that keeps coming in my head. Don't try so hard. Why are you pushing like that? 
the balance, this is what we discovered about the aware jhanas that Sariputta is talking about in, in Anupada Sutta and what he's describing. That sutta to experience what he experienced. And you can, you can, if you're aware and just naturally there and you're watching, you will see those pieces that he talks about in that. It's not a story, it's real, but you can never see it. And you will never believe that I'm telling you, you can see it. If you're concentrating very tight with a pointed concentration on something, if you're concentrating very hard in the breath, you will never see these things inside. It will never happen. And yet all the descriptions of the experiences that are in there, you can match them if you're experiencing it with TWIM, if you're practicing it, because you're not going too hard. You're practicing an open mind. And why are you opening your mind? You're opening your mind so when you close your eyes, there's something to see. You can watch inside. Bhante used to tease me and he'd say, you know, this is the best show in town. Why would you go away and go to the movies? Why wouldn't you take an extra sitting in the forest and not go in town to the movies? Why would you do that? Well, because there really is something to see, to watch, and to learn. And every sitting is different. See, don't try to manage it. The idea of the experiment that Sariputta was doing was what happens if I don't try to manage it, if I move out of the way, if I just watch, then what can happen? You're asking yourself, what is the potential of the human brain if you're not trying to make it do anything and you're just observing, that's what this was, you see? So that's, this is getting you through feeling, okay? So let's keep going with the, um, the uh, let's see, we keep going now with the, um, the pieces, right? So the third piece, the third component, we can call these five components. An aggregate is a component or a part, like a part of an engine or a piece of a clock. That's what it's like. And so this component of the concept of a being and concepts, what are concepts? Concepts are pieces. They, they have pieces that make them up. We mentioned last time, what is a shoe? Well, it has parts, doesn't it? It has the sole of the shoe, the side and the top of the shoe, the, the tongue in the shoe that you tie down, the ties for the shoe, all these different pieces and the inside that you put your foot on. These are the components of a shoe. And an automobile is a concept. But what is an automobile? Is it the windshield or the door or the tires or the gears what is it you see so you have a concept room for building spaceships and a concept room to design automobiles or airplanes then all these other groups make the engine to fit into the concept and the parts of the engines into the engines and so forth like that so that's how concepts work the third component is perception. Perception is very interesting, but we need to be careful we don't make too big of a deal of it because it happens so fast. You have this ability in your brain. Perception is sanya. And for the development of meditation, the essential part of perception is to understand uh, is, to, is that it is a mental process that names things as you're, as you're experiencing it and it has memory in it. So perception perceives, that's what we find out in one of the suttas. I think it's in um, 43, uh, in, in Majima Nikaya number 43. Perception perceives, they tell us, and it names things. So therefore, perception has memory. That's what you need to remember. It has memory and it names things. For example, let's consider the eye for a minute. This is one of your sense doors by which you experience life during your experience in this existence. 
So we would say first, you have a working eye. This is how we would explain it to somebody, anybody, not necessarily a Buddhist. You have a working eye. Here is how we cognize an eye's sensual experience from its beginning. First, we say, when a working eye opens, it meets with color and form, and then the eye consciousness arises and put a period. Then we say the meeting of these three is eye contact. Then we say with contact as condition, feeling arises. The feeling is always pleasant, painful, or neither painful nor pleasant. During this process, perception names the color and form the eye first saw to be a blue glass. If I was holding glass, I have one glass in this place. <laughs> and the one glass is a blue plastic glass. I would say this is a blue glass. That's perception that said that. In order to do this, perception has memory in it from where once before it learned the, about the color blue and the object as being a glass. And this is how it works. It's exactly how this works. So he says, I can see that. Well, we can work through all six of these sense doors using the same formula. And how many sense doors do we have? You have six. The five external sense doors are the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, and body then that is how you experience the outside world, outside. The internal sense door is called mind. Each of these sense doors has a corresponding sense door object, which they come in contact with, and this is how we experience the world. Externally, the eye sees sights, the ear hears sounds, the nose smells odors, the tongue tastes flavors, the body touches tangibles. Internally, mind meets a mind object, a thought. All contact happens in the same way. There's no deviation of how it occurs with the sense doors. To achieve contact, you must have an operating sense door plus a sense door object plus a sense door consciousness equals contact. It's just a little formula. We contact as condition, feeling arises. Feeling is either pleasant, painful, or neither pleasant nor painful. So this is the pretty cut and dry impersonal process. And you can experience it for yourself once you learn all the information you need to identify the process. It's impossible for you to talk about it unless you learn the pieces and how it operates. Number four, the next part of the being is thoughts in Sankara. Thoughts are mind objects, thought formations arising on their own. We do not fabricate all these thoughts. Many of them impersonally arise. I wrote it this way because when we decide to use our brain for formulating something or figuring it out, we're making the machine operate, the brain operate. But other times you're sitting there and you're trying to meditate and you're just pounded with thoughts coming down all around you, right? But I can have a hundred thoughts out here and just be sitting here and not pay any attention to them. Why would I not bother to pay any attention to them? Because of Anicca. <laughs> they're, they're coming and I know they're coming and they will always rise up, then be there and then pass away. I know this. So why should I get so hyper about how to learn about Anicca? In all different kinds of ways, people are inventing it. But a Nietzsche is a fact. It is a law, the same as a law in physics. And we have to get this into our head. Whatever arises will always pass away. So enjoy it while it's there. Don't run away from joy if it comes up. It's a natural thing to evolve and come up. Don't let anybody say that you can't enjoy it when it's there, when it comes up but don't grab a hold of it and try to make it stay 
and don't try to bring it up tomorrow because <laughs> you won't be able to get it back because it was naturally arising before, see? So everything operates on a condition for it to come up. In life, in most cases, the being does not stop doing what they are doing and decide to bring up a thought. This does not happen. Thoughts arise impersonally. So it's hard, for, you can't stop, there's nothing, I'll tell you a secret. There is nothing anywhere in Buddhism that says part of what you should do is stop your brain from thinking. So how does it happen? Aha, that happens when you learn how hindrances operate and stop feeding them. They won't come back for more. And what is it that feeds the hindrance? What is the nutriment for the hindrance or the obstruction or the obstacle or the fetter or the taint? whatever you want to call it, or the barrier. What is it that's making it come back? I make it come back. I am foolish enough to move to it and give it some food. As Soon as it figures out, like the, I was watching the chipmunk on my porch, he finally found me. I moved downstairs in this place. The chipmunk finally found me. And, and so now I think I have to put something on the porch for him. I feel badly about it. You know, because I, he was, the, the chipmunk was just wonderful example of, of um, papancha and confusion and desire and aversion all wrapped up into one. I could put food on a plate and put it on the roof of this villa upstairs. And one chipmunk would come, a big fine fellow, he would come and he would come to eat. Then in a matter of minutes, the second, third, fourth, and fifth one would come. The whole family was there. The first thing, he's eating quietly. And then comes, oh, I have to, you can't bother me, I have to eat. And then the, as soon as he goes to protect himself here, the other one comes and, oh, oh, no, you can't have it. No, 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 it's mine, it's mine. <laughs> and this not sharing, not taking and keeping it personally for himself, trying to chase them away. In the end, when he went to this one, this one came and started to eat. And when he went to that one, this one came and started to eat while he was chasing that one. And he almost didn't get anything because he wouldn't share the plate with the five of them. You know, and I was watching him thinking, boy, this is a Buddhist class right here on the porch. This is a Buddhist class. It was very funny. So suffering arises with the unsatisfactoriness of a painful feeling arising and how the being becomes personally involved with trying to think the feeling away. But the thoughts are one thing and feeling is another. Whenever a feeling arises, if we understand what's going on, then at the first sign of a rising tension and tightness, we can release that feeling, relax and smile as we return attention over to the object of meditation or to whatever task we were doing in daily life. And this is how to keep a wholesome mindfulness going. We do not have to grab onto a feeling and become involved in the feeling and the thinking about it in reference to the past or the future. We do not have to do that. Of course, you have to learn how most things that arise and you have to take me on my word and test it. When it comes up, you're allowed to peek at it. Is this from something about the past? Or is this about something about the future? Or is it something about right now I need to remember? So in the beginning, you can, if the moment you know it's from the past, let it go. And the moment you see it's a worry about the future and you don't know what the future is gonna be, let it go. You see, the future could become anything depending on what we do here and now with the present time. That's the way the Buddha explains it. Only the present time is our concern here and now. Only 
in this present time place are we truly alive? When this moment you're sitting here, you are not alive in the past. And when you are sitting here, you are not alive in the future. <laughs> you are only alive here. It sounds so logical, doesn't it? But when you start looking, you will be amazed at how many of those thoughts that are bugging you are over something from this morning or yesterday or last week or somebody said something and did something. You, you will find out how the mind is trained to hold on to this stuff and what you're trying to do is learn how to let it go. We do not have to grab onto the feeling because uh, become involved in thinking about it in reference to the part, the past or the future. We just don't have to. There's no need to expand the thought when it comes up. After all, if we look at the past, it's done and it's gone, it's fixed in time and it cannot be changed. The future is not here yet and the future could become anything depending on what we do now in the present time. That's the real important part here. So only the present time is where we are alive. And understanding the universal truth here helps us to lighten our life because we only need to carry the present time with us. And that's as light as the clothes that you put on your back. You do not need a backpack to put the past in it and carry it around and put the future worries in and carry them around. I used to talk about, it made me feel like to listen to Bunty teach about this, it made me feel like, well, we're alive and we're flexible and we're young and we can move, you know, with just our clothes on. But what if you had to get up in the morning and when you were going to work, you had to get dressed and then go downstairs, eat your breakfast, go to the door and get your backpack and put on your back with all of your past in it. And then a little front pack, you know, like a baby pack in the front, that's your future worries. And then you try to walk and you can't walk. You're tilting in two different directions and you can't walk. And all because you want to carry with you, keep with you, not let go of anything. And yet those things have no energy in them anymore. Each time we six R uh, and we do right effort, we use the six R's to help us stay in the present. And every time we do the six R's, we, we let go of old tendencies to attach ourselves to something from the past or from continuing to worry about the future. That's the reality. Without the past or the future pushing and pulling at us, we can respond to what is happening in the present time. And we, with, with the, we'll have more energy for sensible mindfulness, for good decisions, to being able to respond instead of reacting. So therefore, it helps us to understand that thought is one thing and feeling is another thing and not forget it that this helps us to see what needs to be done with a clear mind. That's the advantage of staying in the present time, a clear mind and better mindfulness and attention for whatever you are doing. That's why this is not for the retreat. The training is for the retreat, but the practice was for life. A fifth part, the last aggregate of the being is consciousness vinyana, and consciousness cognizes. Now, co to cognize something means to understand it, to explicitly see it clearly. And it is the potential for awareness. It's um, a very interesting thing too, because consciousness, feeling, and perception are also conjoined. They're not disjoined. This is real interesting. Slowly, you can read over Majima Nikai number 43, sections 7 to 9, okay? That's Majima Nikai number 43, sections 7 through 9, and consider what is said there. Any one of these parts, consciousness, feeling, and perception, they cannot operate without the other two. They cannot operate without each other. They are conjoined. OK? 
Okay. Now, I sat on the back step one day to contemplate this and it just kept me smiling. And I did want to believe it was true. <laughs> it was very funny. And for that day when I was working in the forest, I just could not see that it is impossible to separate these three apart. I was determined that I could see it. So if I roll down to the bottom of this for a minute, and at the bottom, I put the molecule. So what this is in the bottom here is feeling, perception, consciousness. This is the molecule that you're looking at. You cannot separate this molecule. It's like saying H2O is water. You can't take the hydrogen out and then the oxygen and put the two oxygens. You, understand, you can't do it. So try to feel, this is what you do for your practice. You try to feel something without being conscious and consciousness is like awareness, okay? And without perceiving it, try to feel something, okay? The next step is you take, try to be conscious without perceiving that you're conscious and without feeling happening. You can't do that either. <laughs> and then the third one is try to perceive something. Perceive something. If you are not conscious, and you're not feeling anything. Try that. <laughs> he made me walk around all over the place for a few days until I finally came back and said, okay, 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 I'm wrong. <laughs> you know, it's impossible to separate these. So Q says, I'll have to try that. You do it, it's fun and fun. Uh, it's a fun one to see. How do you figure this out? Well, what I did was I slapped my hand. This is another way. You slap your hand. And then, then what he says, then you carefully, I considered that when I have a body and I slap my hand, a feeling arises. I have a body and I slap my hand, feeling arises, okay? A painful feeling, of course, if I slap it hard. And however, uh, you, you can't tell me that this is a painful feeling without being involved, can you? I, no, no, he says you can't. So this is where the body feeling and perception are part of the body functions. So body feeling and perception are part of the body function. But feeling, perception, thoughts, and consciousness, they are part of the mental function of this being. Got it? So you have to sort of put it on a piece of paper on the top and bottom. You have to keep looking at it, letting it run, reflect through, contemplate this and see how it's really true. The body, the feeling and the perception are body functions. The feeling, perception, thoughts and consciousness are part of the mental functions. So this is something that the Buddha managed to put together where others failed to understand it. And this little investigation should bring up for you the question of mind-body connection with an answer based on knowledge and vision, meaning direct knowledge, your experience. This is getting really interesting. I told him, I told him, stick around, there's more. <laughs> So what's next? What's next? What happens in our next class is we're going to want to do an exercise to get ready for more interesting stuff with a closer look at the net, at the link called craving. That's what we want to do next. Okay. We want to look at craving because craving is the beginning of what? Craving is the beginning of the red zone <laughs> on the chart of the 12 deep pieces in dependent origination. Okay. So following the entry, I want you to listen. First, this is a little thing for you to do online. You, I want you to go to the Dhammasukha Meditation Center, just dhammasukha.org, okay? And you listen to any, I don't care which one you listen to. It's very consistent in every retreat is the same. I want you to listen to one of the first night talks of one of the Dhamma retreats that's on in the Dhamma, talk library at Dhammasukha. You go and find the Dhamma talk library and you go in there and all the retreats are there. And the first night 
I want you to click open. It'll say how many talks there are. You click it up. Just listen to the first talk because this lesson I gave you tonight about the aggregates is what we always heard at the beginning of every single retreat I ever attended with him. And I attended them basically from 2000, every single retreat until 2014. And then when I came over here, I was back and forth with it. So this is where Bonte gives a clear talk about, about this and he interweaves together the basic operation of a being, six sense doors and how contact happens. And please become aware of your sense doors by taking the time to investigate how you see, hear, smell, taste, and touch. See, if you're good enough and you do some of these exercises, one day you'll sit down in a Mexican restaurant or an Indian restaurant happen to, all of a sudden you'll say to the person next to you, you know, this is the darndest thing. I can taste the flavors and I can tell you which part of my tongue it's the flavor is being tasted on. All of a sudden it will happen to you. You can, you can do that. Okay. <clears throat> Then consider how mind gets attached to thoughts and the attention moves off of the course while you are trying to do some task in uh, life. Take a look at this. Can you notice how it is happening after you saw your 12 links and you have your seven links that you're learning? Can you tell what happened? Now, in the beginning, something's going to happen and you're going to want to follow this. Don't work too hard, watch it. But then after the event happens, go somewhere and sit down have a, some water or just have a drink of tea. And in your mind, what exactly just happened? <laughs> you know, that's what you do. And you piece together. I saw this in the other person. I, I watched it. And I watched the person maybe get upset over something you did at work. And then they said something and I heard it and I had a painful feeling come up and I didn't like it immediately, just really fast. And then I think in my head, it's just like when somebody else did this before in my life and I didn't like it then either. And am I going to be quiet and say, okay, okay. Or am I going to yell back at the person if they're chewing me out? What am I going to do? but you watch how you're working with people and you begin to understand. Um, consider that mind gets attached to the thoughts and the attention moves off. You see that and you begin to watch how this is happening. The second thing is to check out the body mind connection above that we, we mentioned in this lesson in the installment. And our next entry is going to take us a little deeper into a discussion about where craving starts where it starts, how it works in relationship with the suffering. How does it work? Believe me when I say that all of this gets deeper and clearer as you're going along. And this really helps your practice. This is enough to begin with for now. And I showed you this down at the bottom. So this is what's, this is what's going on um, in this lesson. So we, we did pretty good with this. So let's, um, let's stop the sharing now here and go back and look at all of you. Hello. Okay. And um, questions, questions, anybody? Hello. I know somebody has a question. <laughs> and who's, who's got a question? Hmm? No questions. I can't handle this. Driving me crazy. <laughs> okay, here. I do. I. I. I, I mean, I, I. always want to let everybody else go first. Okay. Because, go um, ahead. Go ahead. You know, I, I don't want. I don't. You I don't want to like. Um, yes. Can you hear me? Yep. I can hear you. Okay. So. Um, I guess it's more of a general question, but it's also, of course, related to everything you've been talking today, but when people have gone through extreme sadness for a long time, you know, that's really deeply seated, you know, um, chipping away from, from, from all of that to, to emerge, uh, you know, that's, that's that, it, you know, it takes a lot of practice, I guess, to, 
to get to a point where you can definitely begin to identify when it begins and when it stops. But uh, if you're like, if your modus operandi has been sadness for a long time, you know, that it's, it's not quite so, uh, I guess it's the same thing that you were saying, you know, like people want the result right away and it, and it takes, and it takes development. Okay. There's, really a bummer of a chance to let go of sadness if you don't know how this stuff works, okay? But if you learn about, um, you're talking about usually this kind of sadness has an amount of grief in it. And I personally went through a period where six people in my family died in 10 months. And I couldn't get over one before, you know, it was like, I remember saying to a friend of mine, I mean, I'm an old Christian, you know, and I said, God is hitting me with a hammer to see what, how much I can take. Cause as soon as I was getting over one slam, you know, and this sometime in the one period, like four of them bang, and then two weeks bang, and then three weeks bang, and then four weeks or five weeks and bang. And you just didn't think you could ever come out of this. In those days, I didn't know anything about this, but since then, I've had things and events that have happened. And we have to understand something. Buddhists do cry. Buddhists are not privileged to not have any holes here. We have holes in our eyes. They're called tear ducts. And you are supposed to be crying. You're foolish if you hold things in. And you need to let the wall down. And you need to let out grief and anger and things like that. You need to let it out to vent it, okay? Especially grief. Now, if you're talking anger, there, you, the other thing you have in support with what we're doing is we have the forgiveness practice. So if you come to us and you say, I've been caught with this, and when I start to work with metta, I, this is what happens. Initially, Meta will be strong and you will think, oh, it's there, I can do it. And I feel it in my heart, it's really cool. And it is, then as it starts to get to where it's supposed to move away from the heart up into the head, it gets really little, <laughs> it gets really small. And we don't, if we don't understand what's happening, we come constantly to the interview and say, but where is my meta? And by then you have felt joy maybe come up once. Where is my joy? It reminds me of the old commercial with the little boy and his brothers and the Maypo cereal. I don't know if anybody remembers that, but the little boy sat there and started screaming at his brother when they took the Maypo away and they were gonna eat the Maypo cereal. And the commercial was, I want my Maypo. <laughs> and people come to the interviews and they want their joy. And why can't I have joy? And then if you experience joy, the next thing that happens is, I want to keep it here. I don't want to allow it to go. But joy is subject to anicca. Every single state that you experience is subject to anicca, to arise and be there and pass away. And, joy, and grief comes in waves. It comes in waves like this. And you get to know the cycle of your grief. And when you understand it's okay to grieve, and it's certainly okay to cry when you're doing forgiveness. And men will show up in many cultural settings. Men will show up and they'll start crying and they'll try to suffocate it. But I'm a man, I can't cry. I'm a man, I'm masculine, I'm not supposed to cry. But you have holes in your eyes and that's your pressure release. And it was a human body. In this way, men and women are the same. The story of grief was in Germany. We were in a, um, it was a brewery for beer, it used to be a brewery. And it was um, a farm and then a brewery. And, um, it was like a castle in Bonte. They put Bonte five stories up in a tower. So to do anything for him, you, any of you who helped him, you know what this means. You have to go up to give him the coffee and, the, and down and up and down. And this was a castle for heaven's sakes. 
And I went upstairs and said, you know, is there anything that you need? And he said, please go downstairs to the meditation hall and go down to get my book, you know, bring this Majima Nikai, go get the Majima Nikai and bring it back. That was it. So I just went downstairs and went into the Dhamma hall. When I walked in, we had 30 people in there, 11 men were just bawling their eyes out. And I'd never seen this before. They're just weeping and they're in lines on the, on the aisle, like four here, four here, a couple here like this. And all 11 of them were bawling their eyes out. So I took the book and I went all the way upstairs. And then I told him they're crying. And he said, wonderful. <laughs> and then he said, on the way down, be sure you stop in the closet where the towels are and get them the small towels, make sure everyone has one on their lap because we don't have any tissues. We have to have towels. You have to allow yourself to process things through, okay? And when you practice the uh, forgiveness, you bring something up that's really there. You have permission to cry. What is forgiveness? This is something that I was wanting to do one class on. What is this forgiveness practice? And I've come to realize this forgiveness practice is a dana practice. So when I say dana is generosity, and that practice is a dana practice. Here's how. First of all, you're forgiving yourself. So that's a dana there. Dana for me, right? Dana for me. And the next thing, somebody pops up, you are forgiving that person. You're forgiving the person who died. You're talking to the person who died. If you can't go to the cemetery and sit beside the stone and talk to the person, then we'll pretend that the person is there or you pretend the person is there and you spend time with that person to go through it and you process. Grief is a process. Is there a time frame on grief? No, there is not. Some people wrote books and said maximum three years is okay, but it's not really that way. But I, a, whole new, a whole new view came in front of me about grief after what happened to me before, because I can teach people how to deal with grief. So the first Donna is when I forgive me. The second Donna is when I forgive someone else, there's another Donna, right? That's a Donna for them, okay? And then the last part of the forgiveness is when they forgive me. And when that person forgives me and I feel it, or I see them smile back at me, one or the other happens, I feel this relief, that is the feeling of forgiveness. When you are forgiven by that, that person, you have to follow through the program all the way. People like to cheat with this. It's really a shame. We want to have, um, we wanted to have um, forgiveness uh, retreats, but it was impossible to have a successful forgiveness retreat without people understanding how to practice metta first. So we have a prerequisite that you have to do a retreat for metta to learn the process of the practice first and some of the rules before you try to do the forgiveness. We cannot hold a forgiveness retreat. People will come who don't need it, first of all. And we want people to come who really need to have it. So usually in the retreats, you start by practicing metta. If you run into a wall before you go to the other people, usually you hit a wall and no feeling is there. And you come and we ask you, well, did I forget to mention I just went through a separation or somebody died before I came or something? They don't tell you in the beginning of the retreat what's going on. So we can't do it with them right away. We have to wait a couple of days. And then when we put them over there and they work with the uh, forgiveness, they're following instructions pretty well. The difference with the forgiveness and the metta is when I teach you metta, and you're okay with it, I can say to you, whatever comes up in your mind from the time you start your practice, let it go, relax, smile, come back. See, I can tell you, no matter what it is, what kind of thought it is, you do that. But if I'm teaching you forgiveness, don't you dare 6R before you find out if there's a person there 
or an event where there's a person in the event that you need to forgive. Do you understand? Because if you start your forgiveness practice, if some of you start your forgiveness practice and you're forgiving, you're saying the phrase, I forgive myself for not understanding, or I forgive myself for making mistakes, or I forgive myself for, be, for, um, for not uh, doing things correctly or something or breaking a precept. If you start saying that to yourself and work on yourself, that's good. But if you let go every thought that comes up then you never get a person to start forgiving. And the narcissist just loves this because they sit there and they let every, they say, all these thoughts are coming up. I'm letting it go, letting it go. Well, for heaven's sakes, when you started to forgive yourself, you, your brain heard it and thought maybe they could, maybe you want to forgive this person. So that thought came up and you threw it away. And the, the person got lost. So you never get beyond the first level. You have to go the first level, the second level, third level. So how long does it take to do this? Well, it depends on whether you're going to do the whole program and devote yourself to it and practice this as a primary meditation. And I've had people go and use it for two or three months. I used it for six months. Bonte followed it for two years with nothing else. You see? It's a primary meditation program to take all the way to the end. But also it is a curing, a sort of a, a cleansing mechanism to use in a retreat if somebody is practicing and all of a sudden that feeling just goes away from the heart and won't come up anymore, there's a blockage. We have to spot that. You can't see it. You'll try to push through, make it happen, push it down, make it come up and all this stuff happen. We have to catch you and put you back on track and say, look, if this is a blockage, you should be practicing the forgiveness first to cleanse out everything. Then when you cleanse, you'll come to us and say, I'm through cleansing. I don't want to do this anymore. And when you say that, then it's time for you to try the metta again. And the metta usually just goes along, just goes along like that. It's very nice, very nice. Because by then you figure out, oh, I have a new tool. And that's what forgiveness is. The forgiveness is a tool that, that practice and you have that forgiveness and you put it into the little life's little toolbox. And I have this really great um, life's little toolbox here that I can show you what I mean. Here's life's little toolbox and I put it in there and I just close it up and I keep it. Anytime I wanna use it in my life now, I know how to go in here and get this forgiveness in an event, a breakup, someone dies, anything that happens and pull it out and start using that practice to support myself. I've been using it for the last six and a half months, <laughs> roughly six and a half months at this point, you know? So, so it happens, things come and go and you work, you work that as a, as a, as a cleansing mechanism, see? So you're not locked in sadness forever. The, the, Ulysses, the point is, how do you look at the situation? Do you think this is happening to you? If you believe, if you're in a, a long time of sadness and it's like a depressive state, depression, okay. Do you believe the depression is part of you? Do you believe it is happening to you? Because then it will stay with you for a long, long time because you're feeding that decision to see it as happening to you. And the moment you pay attention to it, you're feeding it every time you buy into it. But if you start to understand, you can change the, the sadness, that part of it, by replacing it with some uplifting thing and going in the direction of that, by keeping your mind busy with uplifted alternatives as the mind state. Do you understand? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So if that's what, if you want to do that, when you come into retreat, we can talk about it. You can run it as forgiveness. I can help you with that. Okay. Okay. Next question. Deepa. Sister, yeah. Uh, how do you differentiate between uh, 
consciousness cognizing and thought formations thoughts are thoughts and cognizing is the outward experience if i come to you and visit you cognize me when i come cognize okay you have to um <clears throat> If you've never met me before, you cognize me when you meet me. When I come the second time, you recognize me, recognize. Notice the words, mm -hmm. you recognize me. Mm -hmm. To cognize me is to comprehend who I am and who, what I am first. Something new, okay? That's what cognition is. In the process of learning, consciousness cognizes. And then builds the library and the problem with the reactions as we go and we repeat, repeat, repeat the same ones and stop cognizing so much and just recognizing and reacting. See, we, we compare it to the stories in the past. It's the one that causes the problem for the Bawa. You know, the Bawa is the, um, the storage center for the, um, the reactions that we always do. Mm -hmm. So it, once you have consciousness defined properly, consciousness cognizes. That's what it tells you in that sutta. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it'll say consciousness, consciousness, consciousness cognizes. It cognizes blue, it cognizes red, it cognizes yellow. See? Mm -hmm. And then once it's done that, it's inside you. From then on, you recognize a yellow bird you recognize a blue glass, mm -hmm. get it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But thoughts, thoughts mm -hmm. are formations of firings from the brain. And right. thoughts simply arise. This is not the same thing. Thoughts are just arising, okay? But like I said a while ago, you have to be kind of careful how you talk about thoughts because uh, not all thoughts are just spontaneous without having anything to do with you if you're using a analytical process with a subject at college and you're getting ready for exams right you're using right. the brain power and you're you're utilizing the um cognitive function of the brain and everything right. to understand everything okay so you're figuring out formulas sometimes and figuring out different things that's the figuring mind okay okay and uh, the, yep. the reason I was asking the question was if, if you know, since when you're in an analytical work um, uh, domain, you, you have this tendency to get caught up in thoughts and then, uh, then there are these repetitive thoughts. And sometimes you, there is a delusion that is created that maybe there is something constructive going on there that I need to pay attention um too so okay. how do i what are we talking about if we're talking at work and you're trying to develop a content for a book or or some kind of um uh, what do you call it a tech manual or something like that yeah. and you're doing content work um you're looking for structure and identifying different parts that's a function of the brain and you're trying to understand it and put it together and fit it together okay those thoughts are okay it's like when we say when you're when you're practicing meditation, there's two kinds of thoughts. There's the thought um, of, oh, that's a Nietzsche. Wow. And you come back and keep meditating. Or you say, oh, I see Atta. Wow. Or you say, ah, I just realized what Anatta is. <laughs> Not paying attention. You find out if I don't pay attention to any of these thoughts, they're going to stop happening. They're not going to permanently stop happening. They can come and in your job and continue to happen. The interesting part about this is um, I'm an old musician, <laughs> okay? And as a vocalist, um, a lot of things that I couldn't hear in music before when I was learning meditation with Bhante um, in 2002, 2006, I was still listening to a lot of orchestral work and music, heavy music, complicated music. But now I can hear all of the parts and the mathematics in Bach, but I couldn't before. Do you see how different it is? Yeah. So uh, the Rachmaninoff vocalese, for instance, is a, is a complicated thing. 
I never could grasp before. And I pulled it out one time just to play with it and see what would happen. And my mind was so clear when I pulled it out. I had been with equanimity and I wanted to see what would happen. Vocalizing is much easier. You know, if I go back and play around with vocalizing, I don't habitually do it anymore. I secretly sing to the squirrels when I'm in the forest. <laughs> That's my thing. <laughs> but I can hear every single mathematical part of the music. That's the difference. Where I couldn't before. And I don't have a piano, so I couldn't play with, but keyboard would be a lot easier now. See? Okay. Anybody else? Li Ching? Yeah? Yeah, no. Uh, good. I, I, I just wanted to ask a follow-on question. So how would you distinguish between... Uh, perception, perceiving, and consciousness cognizing. Um, say it again for me. Perception and what? Uh, how do you distinguish between perception and consciousness cognizing? Consciousness? Okay, consciousness, the job of consciousness is to cognize. Do you understand cognize? Yep. Okay, let's look it up. I think that one was in here. I think I found it. My little, if I go and look in, um, I found it, I think yesterday, I think I did find it to cognize. Mm. Oh, maybe. I must have gone online to do it. Can somebody, is somebody on the computer? Uh, will you look up, do you, just pop in there and say, do you find cognize? And tell me what comes up. Read what comes up. It's not in the, um, it's I thought it was. Perceive, know, or become aware of. Yeah. See, to know, to know it, or to come, become aware of it. And it's becoming aware of it the first time. Because what you have is the word, um, Consciousness cognizes, you can go to Majima Nikayan number 43, okay, and you can look and see what they're saying to you about consciousness in that part. I can do it for you, isn't it? It's really short. Um, Sister Kema, just a reminder to the time. Huh? We had decided one hour, uh, 30 minutes for today. <laughs> we tried. <laughs> All right, well, it's okay if we're in questions here, we can keep going until a, a little while longer. But the part, here you go, consciousness. Consciousness is said, friend, with reference to what is consciousness said. It cognizes, it cognizes, friend. That is why consciousness is said. What does it cognize? It cognizes pleasant, it cognizes painful, it cognizes neither painful nor pleasant it cognizes it cognizes friend that is what consciousness is said why consciousness is said so that's in uh Majima Nikai number 43 uh section four okay that's what that was now when you look at perception perception is said friend with reference to what is perception said it perceives it perceives, friend. That is why perception is said. What does it perceive? It perceives blue, it perceives yellow, it perceives red, it perceives white, it perceives. It perceives, friend. That is why perception is said. Okay? Got it? So perceiving means to name something. If we go into more detailed word books, we find more of an explanation beyond because it's not fair for me to say perception perceives i'm taking the root word of perception to give the definition it's not fair so this is a perception perceives to perceive something is to name name it that's we have to go one step further okay and consciousness cognizes like i was telling deepa the first time that you meet ingrid you cognize her, but the second time you recognize her, you recognize her. That's where the word comes from. Okay, is that okay, Lee? Yep, thanks. Okay, 
we don't have to get really involved with perception because it's not something that you have to struggle to see and find and twist and make more complicated. And I've heard some people take it and write books on it. And I'm there, why are you bothering with perception? Because it's a very small, quick, hyper, hyper fast part of contact happening. You have the eye that sees the color and form. That's all it sees. And then what happens is eye consciousness comes up and the meeting of the three is contact. Within those three pieces, very fast, was the perception of the blue glass or wow. the red rose. Do you understand? It's so fast, it makes no sense unless you don't want to go any further down the path and you want something to do. So you come to the retreat and sit there for the whole retreat trying to see perception. <laughs> You know, I was making a joke with somebody about that once because it's just not worth it because it's happening so fast in the brain. But they do identify it correctly because perception perceives. And it is the naming of what you are seeing or what you are smelling or hearing or tasting or touching. You see? Okay. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Next one. Boy, this is fun. Come on, our deep game is a good one. <laughs> well, sister. Uh, oh, yeah. um, you pulled, you yeah, want to, you, you pulled. No, wait, keep going. I can't, I can't quite hear you. Okay, okay. I, I'm not sure if it's, uh, uh, well, I'll ask my question anyway. Um, thank you very much for the, the talk, uh, Sister Kima. Um, you mentioned that uh, feeling and perception were part of body. Um, and I just wondered if you would uh, go through that again. You also mentioned this part of mind as well. No, um, I, don't think, I don't think you got that right. Wait a second, let me go back. Um, body, feeling, and perception are part of body functions. That's correct, it is. Okay, and, oh, wait a minute. Oh, how can that be? It's doubled over. I doubled over, didn't I? Feeling, perception, thoughts, and consciousness. Wait, okay, body, feeling, oh, I see. Body, thought, perception, perception. Maybe he put it in there for two times. This is Bonte's statement. Body, feeling, and perception are part of the body functions. Yeah, because the brain is doing the perception. I get it. It's getting, the, the brain, it's a perceiving thing, all right. Feeling, perception, thoughts, and consciousness are part of the mental functions. Yeah, oh, I was wondering, I was, I was wondering whether it... I don't know why it's written like that. That's all okay. I have to figure that one out. You need to write me a note, please. Write me a note and I'll try to fish around and see why that happened. Very okay. good. Very okay. good. That'll get me going. <laughs> Okay, just write me a note, okay? Okay, Ardika? Yes, sister? Did you have a question? All right, yeah, actually, um, there's this question asked to me, like, um, how, how do you actually explain what is forgiveness to a kid? Like, um, like age, like maybe like five to 10 years old? like how to divine what forgiveness is. To well, them. I'll tell you, I'll, I'll tell you something. You can consider this. The Russians in one dialect had a problem with forgiveness when we were developing it with one of our students. It took us three weeks to find a word to substitute for forgiveness. And so the substitution word was to accept. In the case of that situation, um, I forgive myself for I forgive myself for making, mista making mistakes. I would say I accept myself for making mistakes. I'm accepting myself. And we passed it through and everything worked like clockwork. It worked very well. So if the person is living in, a, say, a religious situation where there's absolutely no forgiveness, or maybe a, a colony, not colony living, what am I calling that? Um, group living situation where sometimes it's established there's just no forgiveness, okay? Or some, they're dealing with somebody like that. Can you accept what happened and let it go into the past is to forgive somebody. 
So we, we used all these word books. We were searching all over the place to figure this out. And then what was funny was the guy in Moscow said, oh, that's ridiculous. There is a word in Russian, but he was on the eastern part of Russia. And this guy we were working with was on the far western edge of Russia, <laughs> near the Black Sea, <laughs> you know? And um, th there's a dialect problem here. One r area absolutely doesn't have forgiveness concept, okay? And the other area, it, ha it was built into it, see? But using, I accept the fact that that happened and I can let it go. The big one is, can you let it go? Because you, you ask, play, if it's a young person, ask, take them through the lifeline exercise that I taught you with dependent origination. That's the, I call it the balancing your mind before you study the dependent origination. In the charts I gave you, you take them through that lesson. It's non-denominational. It's not religious. It's not science. It's just fact. The past, what is, you ask, don't teach them, ask the, the person what is true about the past. If I came to you with a spelling word, P-A-S-T, I'm going to ask you and you be my father and tell me what is true about the past. What does it mean? And have them tell you. You can, don't, you facilitate, you don't teach them. You get them to tell you. Then take them into the future and ask them what the future means. And you get to hear, <coughs> hear them tell you what's true about the future. It isn't here yet. We don't know what it is. We can't identify it. I have to get a cough drop. Wait a minute. <coughs> I'm sorry, it gets really dry in here sometimes. So, sister, do, do you yeah. have like a simpler, uh, like simple, simpler answer to like a very short answer to answer this kids? You know, like, like. Well, I teach I teach five to twelve year olds all the time this stuff, and mm -hmm. my students in Sunday school were nine to twelve years old, and they learned everything I've taught you so far. They memorized it and they took a test on it for their Buddhism at the end of the year. And they just recited it and recited it and remembered it all. I was in a situation where we had to run a Sunday school for one season without a Sunday school director and there were no books, there had been a fire. And so we asked them, okay, we'll do this, we'll volunteer for it. Bunch of, you know, um, of, uh, uh, what do you call it? Um, oh gosh postgraduate people and myself and a couple other people from the Buddhist studies department. And I said to him, well, what are we supposed to teach you? Is to teach him what you know. Boy, that was dangerous to say that to me. <laughs> so I was teaching them the foundation series that you're learning and I was teaching them dependent origination and they learned all of this stuff. And they, they were just, they won when they went down to uh, Candy for their tests in Sri Lanka, they won all the prizes. They sang the dependent origination song to the people. Can you summarize it? Your huh? answer. Can you summarize your answer uh, for the forgiveness? Well, he asked me to. No, it wasn't a question about forgiveness, was it? Oh, forgiveness. forgiveness. I just told you that the simple answer is: instead of working on forgiving something, can you accept, take acceptance instead of forgiveness? Because if you run into somebody. How does it work? If you run into a heavy duty Catholic person, somebody who's Catholic, really strong Catholic, they might say to you, nobody can forgive you except God. And if they say that to you, it's okay. You know what I say to them? Because I know a lot about Christianity. If you forgive yourself first, before you go to ask God to forgive you, he'll appreciate it because you did your share of the work. And that's the truth. You see, then if you get on your knees, yeah, and, and you ask forgiveness, it's, it's fine to do your part. Well, acceptance, uh, as in uh, accept what has happened to you. I accept, so, it. okay, you, 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 you and I have a fight, 
like I'm looking at our deacon, you and I have a fight. And uh, these two men in, in Russia, they had a big fight and lasted five years. They hated each other. Finally, one of them was practicing forgiveness. But when he was practicing forgiveness, he had to say acceptance. I accept what happened. I accept uh, that I have made mistakes. I accept that I got angry and we had a big fight. And I can accept that and I can let it go. So the point is, it's past. Whatever it is that happened, it is past. That's why I told you to go to the rebalancing. Teach the person the rebalancing line. The life continuum line with the pet birth and death and, and what the past is, what the future is, and what the present time is. Lighten the person up so they're not carrying this grudge around, this hate, this dislike and anger or whatever. Revenge. Yeah? So, sister, so the scenario is that um, this kid was actually mistreated by the teacher. And the other teacher actually told him that you have to forgive uh, your teacher because she didn't really, uh, what is that? Uh, she didn't really meant to do that to you. But, and then this kid actually asked her that, oh, so um, teacher, what is forgiveness? So in, uh, what, what I mean is, if there's this All right, case, Kenny, uh, what in this case, these kind of questions, yeah. Uh -huh. In this case, what to answer, you know, like a simple question. I mean, like, uh, yeah, okay. So, can you, you say to him, you say that, can you accept what happened and let it go now because it's in the past and it uses up your energy each day if you keep carrying this burden around of what happened in the past? So, can you let it go and try to live in the present time? And forgive your teacher too. You know, let accept what the teacher did. She may not have been right. She's the authoritative figure. She might not be right. I know plenty of cast classrooms where the person is like a dictator, and if and and it's not right. But that's what you have to live with at the time and deal with. If you have no recourse, if you have no path of grievance, you know that's what we're up against. So you you accept it and you let it go. And you get free of the past event. What they do, you, you can't do anything about the other person. You have to tell them that. You can't change the other person, okay? But you, for, you accept what happened and try to do the best you can in your, your circle around yourself. You're responsible for yourself. And the kids have to understand they can't make the other person change. But they can change the situation by them giving up the, the bad vibrations and energy of hatred and jealousy and revenge and anger and letting it go. Because why? Why should they? They'll say this to you. The kids will come back and they'll say, why should I? Because you're carrying it and it's hurting you still. Because that event is out. Do you know the story about the two monks? You know the story about the two monks, Ardika? Oh, which because one? The young monk is following the old monk up the mountain. He's taking him up to the temple in the village on the top. He gets to a stream, they have to cross, and there's an old woman there. Oh yeah, I, yeah, I know this. Remember that? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Do you remember what the young monk did? The old monk, he picked up the old woman, carried her across the stream and put her down and then started walking. The young monk had a hissy fit. He was really upset the rest of the way up the mountain. And when he got to the top, he said, I have to ask you, teacher, why did you touch that woman? Why did you carry her? And he said, I put her down, but apparently you haven't. <laughs> he did what needed to be done, and then he went on. You see? So the young person has to learn it's better off for them in their own interest to let go of what anger and all these things do to you inside. They keep you from your work. They keep you worrying. They keep you thinking of ways to get back at the other person. None of which is healthy for you at all. You see? One more uh, uh, explanation uh, Buddha gives is uh, for forgiveness is abhay, abhayana. Mm. That is a meaning that you give the other person the gift of fearlessness. There you go. Maybe a uh, bigger mm -hmm. concept for a five-year-old, but I'm just say, uh, saying as a forgiveness. The so this is a, five, is a, this is a, a gift five. of fearlessness. So you give up your 
uh, 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 your claim yeah. to revenge, and yeah. that is also called as forgiveness. Yeah, but this is a five to ten year old, five, listen, eight, and eight. nine years old, they know everything there is on the computer to fix anything I need. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, you know, these kids are smart. He'll know what you're saying if you explain it to him that way. Okay. Yeah. Any, any more Anybody questions? else have a question? <laughs> yes, yes, sir. Okay, Fendi, yeah. Uh, sister, uh, they, they have a saying that in a healthy body, there is a healthy mind. So how, do we, how should we see it in Buddhism? It's a healthy mind, healthy body, not the healthy body, healthy mind. It's a healthy mind, healthy body. I bet if you go back and look around, you'll find that, okay? You know, when you're practicing the six R's, we have asked you to see if you can notice that when you recognize something and you're holding on to something, when you release it and you relax, between the relax and the smile and come back, right there, there is a tiny, tiny, tiny little thing, just that big, you know, really tiny spot that is pure mind, right? And if you let go of something, you can feel the, the relief of the craving is let go completely. There's no craving in that spot. It's a validation, a confirmation of the existence of the state of cessation. It's very exciting if you can be very quiet. And when you're letting go, relax, smile, and then right there between the relax and the smile, see? There's no craving. Your body's healthy at that point. You can put a wire a person up and you can see that when the mind is released, everything, you gotta understand this head of ours. <laughs> this is like a, a, a command center for a spaceship, you know? This is running everything in your body. Any problems that you have with your skin, with your organs with your circulation goes on and on when you look in an anatomy book where does it all come from an operation keep it going the brain you see the mind the, what's happening here if you're free and living in the present time and letting go of the past and letting go of the future you are cleaning house you are taking the stuff out of the Closet, everybody who has a house has one closet usually in America anyway. That's packed from the floor to the ceiling. You don't want anybody to open the door and look at what's in there. All the stuff from the past is in there. You see? When you're practicing this way, you're letting go of the past. You're not getting involved in the future. You're getting lighter just tomorrow. You're getting lighter because you're going to live in the present time what did we show you? Like this bell, you know, it's like a, a boat and it's just going across through life like this and you're inside the bell. You're inside this bowl. And if you stay on track, that's the present time. But if you start loading stuff in the trunk, then it's going to wiggle and fall off track. <laughs> and there's going to be something wrong with your body. You get sick more often. You, you know anybody at work, every time somebody gets sick, they get sick. There's always somebody in a big accounting firm that, oh, you can always find that person. They're too, too overloaded with work and like this and they're working, they're all stressed out. So when you're stressed out, what happens to your heart? What happens to your stomach? What happens to your blood system? What happens to your gastrointestinal system? Do you get constipated? And you have to eat a different food to be able to even get unconstipated and released. All this is happening from your head. You see what I'm saying? The idea with the Buddha is say this mind body connection is a genuine real thing. And there's another book, if you ever want to go find it. I don't know how to spell this. I should call my Russian friend and ask him. Shichitsunitsun. It's Shichitsunitsun is how you, Shichit. Shishichinisan is the name of the book called Flow in Athletics. 
It's something about flow in athletics. And to be in the flow in athletics means if I'm flying a plane or I'm, uh, you know, riding uh, some equipment in the ocean or something, you know, uh, whatever they call that, I can't remember. I have to really pay attention <laughs> or I can have an accident. If I'm racing with a bike, you know, I have to be just here, just here is only thing that's important is what's on the bike. That's being totally in the flow with no other thought at all going on in your mind. That's the Olympic athlete. See? So they're identifying with this mind-body connection. And the other example I gave you was in the emergency room when somebody comes in from an accident. They put them in the emergency bay. There's usually five or four, usually five or six people around them in the hospital where I was working. And uh, the one person that is the most important person there is the person that's closest to the person's head because if they're conscious and you can catch their eye and they will calm down right away if you tell them it's okay, you're going to be all right, we're here, we're working on you the best we can and they can relax, then the blood pressure stabilizes and the blood flow and the, every, every system in your body does. From what? From what the person did right here in meeting their eyes and getting them just to understand. Everything changed in that emergency bay. And that person has a good chance of surviving if they calmed down in the bay so that they can determine what needs to happen and how much medicine you can be given and get you to an operating room, then they're likely you'll survive. But if you come in unconscious and they can't communicate with you, chances change. It's more critical because we can't get you to, to help us, you see, in the bay. So see how important that is? And the medical community is in touch with the mind-body connection. So this is a real type of thing that you're dealing with. And you're dealing with training your mind to help you with this in another way. Anybody else have a question? Hi, Sunil, how are you? Mm. How are you? I do have a question. Okay. <laughs> you brought up the example of a narcissist who only forgives himself or herself. And they're the kind of person who in an airplane, when they say put the oxygen mask on yourself first and then on your child, they're busy with the oxygen mask their whole life only on themselves. They never are able to get oxygen for themselves. So when you live with such a person, how do you, you know, people keep telling you don't be treated like a doormat, don't take, keep, keep taking for granted. And I sometimes think, you know, maybe that's just my past karma I have to play out. Maybe even if I don't think about past karma, if I can just help somebody, if I'm being there for someone, I can just be there. So where, where do I see it, you know, between not being taken for granted and just being there for the other person? Because I have the discernment when I want to help them and when I don't. <laughs> I don't separate anymore. <laughs> it used to be, I remember years ago, I was kind of picky, but I don't separate anymore. You know, it's like you look at what the need is and compassion is simply seeing a person in pain and knowing that they need space to yeah. feel their own pain and go through it. But is that person cold or is they are, are they uncomfortable or can you give them something simple? Can you give the man, um, oh, there was this one man, I never understand, but they finally told me what it was. Every evening, and I can't remember whether it was in Arangabad or whether it was in another place, Amrawati, there's a man and he goes to the street corner and he lays down to sleep on the street. On the street, not on the pavement, on the street. And he's on that corner. Everybody in that area knows he does this every night. And he, he, he sleeps there. And finally, I begged this person to explain why is he doing that? Because that's a spot where his wife died. And he can't put it together. He can't pull it, put it together. And he's going to stay right there. He's not going to leave that spot. And it, it just broke him apart. What can we do for him? 
we can make sure that he doesn't get cold or, he, or if he's too hot or if he's ill, we has enough water or he has aspirin or whatever he needs. We can help him. You know, what you can do, you have to choose for yourself how much that you can do for a person. The saddest thing they did to me in the last 174 days was they locked me in this place. Basically, I don't go anywhere. I can't. <laughs> it's impossible. They said the funny part about this place is I probably shouldn't say. <laughs> well, I'll tell you the truth. They just declared, they got on the radio and declared all the restaurants were open. Come on up to Goa, right? Except for one thing, all of the staffs for all of the restaurants are still in other communities, villages, and other countries even that serviced as cooks and chefs and the people that took care of these restaurants. So we went to lunch the other day just for the fun of it. My neighbor and I, we tried to go to lunch and the owner was there. You knew that this, he was the owner. And we had a very dried out bread omelet with just totally dry and a cup of tea and we paid them and we left. But I said, the reason that happened was because he had no staff at all. Because they might have finally said, you can come and sit down. We haven't been allowed to, if I only go shopping one day, I go out of here a week to a food store and a pharmacy and I come back and my friend wants to stop for a coffee at a coffee house and get a little cake and a coffee. I said, okay. We went to the coffee house, they put it in a bag and we got back in the cab and went home because they blocked off all the places where anybody can sit outside. They won't let anybody go anywhere here. And now we're approaching the season. So you listen carefully to what they say. <laughs> you see, so, uh, I mean, you, do, you do what you can do that you yeah. feel good in your heart. You don't give away your life savings to somebody but you do what you can do. And if all you can do is go for 20 minutes and sit there and listen to somebody talk to you, then maybe you do that. If you can afford to buy them a new shirt and pants, maybe you do that. If you can afford to make sure they have water when it's 46 degrees in Mumbai, maybe you do that, <laughs> you know? So what can a person do is an odd question because it's like, what, what do you feel? you can do but you see what i'm saying it's I compassion what you're saying is if i'm doing something should for them i should genuinely do it for them not do it for the sake of just uh compliance you know what i do i look at them and say if i'm ever in that position what would i want a person to do for me if i was ever in that position totally on the street i was almost on the street one time in my life almost, but I had a, somebody who made a deal with me uh, to, to, re, uh, to remodel three apartments and live in one in a, a what do you call, historic, historic house. So I really lucked out because I, get, I needed to take my feelings out on things. So I ripped out the ceilings and ripped off the walls and destroyed everything so I could redo the walls and the ceiling and the floors. And so we had a good agreement. <laughs> I was very lucky. I didn't have to pay rent. I just had to re, re, refurbish everything in this historic house. <laughs> okay. Yeah. It's like, yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I don't, we need your, your, um, I can't hear you, hear you. Oops, I can't hear you. Deverton, it's um, it's you. Indu, I can't hear you. I don't know how to hear. <laughs> I can't hear. You're, okay. Increase the mic, mic. Check mic? the mic. I can't, I can't hear her. Hmm. Ingrid, do you have a question? Yeah, yeah, not a question. I just wanted to say uh, there's a definition of forgiveness. You know, when a tree is being hurt by a stone, but it still gives very nice fruit. So that is the answer that was given to one child. 
when they were asking what is forgiveness you said to me but the seed still gives very delicious fruit giving it a place to plant i i see that's good that's good anybody else steve you have a question anybody are we done i, I think, think we are two hours okay. now by the way <laughs> <laughs> yeah Hey, this is a really good session. I'm proud of you all. Now, next time you write some questions down and I'm saving questions. If you send them in to me, I'm saving them so we can um, talk about uh, some things as they come up. And remember, if you have a request for a particular class, the two that we have right now, one is for a glossary having a glossary discussion about words, our terminology, our definition for words, okay? We do have a glossary. We can do that and use that for one of our classes, okay? And another one was, um, gosh, I forget what the other one was. Uh, eightfold path, three ways of seeing. Oh, okay, that's path. it. That's what the other one was. Okay, there was the other one was a class request for a review of the three versions um three versions or of the eightfold path mm -hmm. yeah because that's kind of fun yeah okay okay so let's say our prayer okay here we go let's see may suffering one be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be May the grieving shed all grief, and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu.